Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to Adon Alam Messianic Congregation. Uh, we are glad to have you here this evening. I hope you had a great week. Um, as a Messianic Jewish congregation, we are here to proclaim the Jewishness of our Messiah Yeshua, the Jewishness of our New Covenant faith. And one of the ways we do that is by using Hebrew uh, in some of our songs and some of our prayers, but we will translate the Hebrew because we see ourselves as, the, as a community, as the one new man that Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, uh, talked about in Ephesians chapter 2, Jew and Gentile coming together to worship as one. And we also see our gathering this evening as a weekly divine appointment that has been established by the creator of the universe. And so we trust that this service will be a blessing to you. We are currently in a 40-day season known as the season of Teshuvah. It actually uh, just started. This is our first Friday night service. Uh, in these 40 days that lead up to the holiest day on the uh, count the appointed times of the Lord, uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Um, <clears throat> the 40-day period begins with the uh, first day of the sixth month uh, on the Hebrew calendar, the month of Elul. And the Hebrew root, uh, shuv, that we find in the word teshuvah means to return or to turn back. And so teshuvah has the idea of looking within and realizing our need to turn back to the Lord. It is only through Messiah Yeshua that we are able um, to leave uh, our uh, desires for this world and for what has drawn us away from the Lord and to turn back to Him. And one of the ways that uh, we look within is by sounding a blast on the shofar, just to draw our attention uh, to this special season uh, that is uh, observed in traditional Judaism. So at this time, I'm going to ask Jeremy Prelwitz uh, to come up and to sound a blast on the shofar as a call to assembly and repentance as we ask the Lord to search our hearts as we hear the blast of the shofar. <laughs> Now, I did the shofar blast on Tuesday night, Jeremy, and it sounded just like that. <laughs> Some of you weren't even here on Tuesday night and don't know to laugh at that. No, we're really blessed by Jeremy's talents on the shofar. He's done it so well, we'll give him another chance tonight. We're going to uh, inaugurate our service in the traditional way, and that's with the lighting of the Sabbath candle. So I'm going to ask Mae Galloway to come up at this time. And we uh, usually explain that uh, traditionally there are often two candles because we are given two primary instructions in the scriptures regarding the Sabbath. We are to shamor, to keep or guard or observe the Sabbath, and we are to zahor, to remember the Sabbath, l'kad shem, to keep it holy. And I'll also explain that the reason for the waving is the idea of welcoming the Sabbath, which is thought of as a bride. Uh, and so we welcome the Sabbath and then the eyes are covered because the uh, seeing the Sabbath lights is a blessing, but you can't receive the blessing till after you say the blessing. So um, by tradition, that is how uh, we light the Sabbath candles. 
Now I'm going to call up our cantor for the evening, Fred Scott, and ask everyone to please stand as we will be chanting the prayer known as the Shema. Uh, this prayer is based on Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And in this prayer, once again, as a community, uh, we affirm the oneness, the uniqueness of our God. Yeshua referred to the first line of the Shema as the greatest commandment. We'll chant the prayer in Hebrew, and then we will recite the English translation and the verses that follow in Deuteronomy 6. Together, the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai. Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up and you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and they shall be frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates and you shall love your neighbor as yourself amen amen I emphasize the your because that's the way it's written in the Hebrew. It's a, uh, we just proclaimed a community directive regard, or proclamation that uh, the Lord is one, and then it shifts to an individual statement as to how we are to relate to our Creator. You individually shall love Him with all your heart and on and on. Okay, um, now I would ask you to join with me as we open our service in prayer. Eloheinu velohavotainu velohavraham eloheitzkach velohayaakov. Our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather together, Lord, for this uh, divine appointment that you have established, this mikra kodesh, this sacred gathering, this holy convocation. Uh, Lord, each week uh, as we Take this day, Lord, to reflect on you, to cast aside the cares of this week and the cares of this world, and to turn our attention fully towards you, uh, to reflect on all of the blessings that we have experienced, so many that we take most of them for granted. But Lord, our hearts are also heavy as we think about uh, our Jewish people in Israel fighting a war for survival. And Lord, we pray that you would watch over them, that you would protect them. Uh, that their leaders would trust in you, that you would give them the leaders that you want them to have for such a time as this. And we pray for our nation, Lord, uh, that the body of believers would come together as one, that we would support uh, your people who you call the apple of your eye. And that in this election, Lord, you would give us the leaders that you want us to have, not necessarily the leaders that we deserve, Lord, by your grace. We ask you to anoint this service, the singing, the dancing, the worship, the praise, the message, the liturgy, the fellowship time afterwards, all that we do this evening, Lord. We dedicate it to you. We uh, <clears throat> uh, just uh, do it for your glory, for your honor, and for your praise. We ask these things in our Messiah, Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and now I'm going to call up Pamela Arnold to bring us our announcements <coughs> for the week. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. And welcome to Adonadol Messianic Congregation. If you are a first time visitor, please raise your hand so we can all acknowledge you. <laughs> if you have not yet received a visitor's packet, please keep your hand raised so we can get one to you. The packet contains brochures which tell you about our congregation and our services. 
You will also find a visitor's card, which we could, would ask for you to kindly fill out and place in the offering box next to the American flag after the service. Once again, we are blessed to have you with us this evening. This Tuesday, we will continue our interactive class on Messianic Approach to the Book of Romans. This week, we will be discussing the latter parts of Romans 1, how Paul addresses the issue of what about those who have never heard of the scriptures. Are, all are welcome. Next month, we will be observing the High Holy Days, beginning with our observance of the fifth annual appointed time, as we will have Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets service on Wednesday, October 2nd at 7.30 and Thursday, October 3rd at 4 o'clock. All are invited to join us for these services. And now, we pray that the Lord's blessing upon you and hope that you will feel his sweet spirit as you worship with us. Once again, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. <coughs> Thank you, Pamela. Now we will chant the traditional prayer known as the Vishamru, which means, and they shall keep. Uh, we will be chanting the Hebrew of Shemot, Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17. Uh, and we will also have the uh, English translation with a messianic paragraph that we have added at the end. First, we will chant the Hebrew of Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17, the Vishamru. Vishamru, as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he ceased from work and rested. And we know our Messiah Yeshua observed the Shabbat. In the New Covenant Scriptures we are told, as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Amen. Now we are going to enter into the scripture portion of our service, and I'll we'll call forward our ARC attendant, Mick Jones, uh, as well as Randall Anderson. Um, <clears throat> wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not here. It's in the back. Okay, new moon. I knew that. I just thought we were getting to it slower. It's here somewhere. 
we're not going to have the new moon if I can't find it. <laughs> the new moon signals the beginning of each month on the Hebrew calendar. Psalm 81 verse 3 says, Blow the shofar at the new moon, at the full moon, on our feast day. So I will now call up Jeremy Prelwitz once again uh, to sound the blast of the shofar, this time because this is our first service uh, following the new moon associated with the sixth month, once again the month of Elul. <laughs> As part of our commemoration, our congregation also marches the Torah scroll around the synagogue on the first Friday following the new moon. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we are going to have uh, David Lewis uh, come up as he will be marching the Torah as well as our singers and dancers uh, who will line up behind him. And we ask that as the ark is opened, you would please stand. Time for a little bit of messianic show and tell, even though it's a little bit um, out of order. Uh, we want you to know that the Torah is a term that we use um, for a scroll yeah. uh, that is written on a parchment made from the skin of kosher animals. It's housed in a piece of furniture traditionally called the Ark, which reminds us of the Ark of the Covenant, where the presence of the Lord dwelt. Uh, <clears throat> the words of the Torah are written by specially trained craftsmen known as soferim, or scribes. And it takes about a year to scribe an entire Torah scroll. If a mistake is made, the scroll is unusable until it is corrected. If the mistake is in writing the name of the Lord, the entire section must be scribed all over again. This ensures that over thousands of years, we have had handed down an accurate copy of God's word. Come on up here if you would. The Torah is covered with a decorative mantle to protect the parchment. Also, there is a pointer called a yad, which is the Hebrew word for hand. <coughs> hand. Uh, <coughs> the uh, the uh, yad enables the reader to keep his place without having to touch the scroll, which over time will smear the ink and soil the parchment. Uh, we will march the Torah around the congregation in a figure eight so that uh, the entire community is encircled uh, with the word of God. It allows the Torah to pass um, all of the aisle seats and it's customary to reach out with the fringes of the talit, the prayer shawl, uh, or a Bible, or even the hand and touch the Torah and then bring it to our lips based on Psalm 119 verse 103 which says, that the word is sweeter than honey to our mouths. So if you would like an opportunity to touch the Torah as it passes, and there's someone between you and the Torah, just knock them out of the way. No, um, you can make your way to the nearest aisle. We'll be coming down both sides of the aisle. And you can also join in the march uh, and come and line up behind the dancers. So at this time, we will begin our Torah march.
Shabbat shalom, y'all. Shabbat shalom. And it came to pass, whenever the ark went forward, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. May those who hate you flee from before you. For from Sion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord out of Yerushalayim. Blessed be he who in holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Unique is our God, great is our Lord, holy and revered is his name. Magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours yours O lord is the kingdom and you are exalted as head over all exalt the lord our god and worship at his holy mount for the lord our god is holy amen i will now ask our scripture readers to come forward he who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless David, son of Yeshua, and Linda, daughter of Yeshua, who have come up to honor God and his word. May the Holy One bless them and their families and send blessing and prosperity on all the work of their hands. Amen. Amen. And now for the blessing before the reading of the Torah. Barakot Adonai Hambarach. Bless the Lord who is blessed. Baruch Adonai Hambarach my head. Bless the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Bachar Lanu Kohamim Venatan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Atah Adonai, Nelatein HaTorah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all peoples and gave us the Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. This is the fourth day of the sixth month on the Hebrew calendar, the month of Elul. Our Torah reading for this evening is taken from Deuteronomy, chapter 17, verses 8 through 13. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Devarim. We'll be reading from chapter 17, verses 8 through 13, found on page 216 of the Complete Jewish Bible. If a case comes before you at your city gate, which is too difficult for you to judge, concerning bloodshed, civil suit, personal injury, or any other controversial issue, you are to get up, go to the place which Adonai, your God, will choose, and appear before the Kohanim, who are Laba'im, and the judge in office at the time. Seek their opinion, and they will render a verdict for you. You will then act according to what they have told you there in that place which Adonai will choose. You are to take care to act according to all their instructions. In accordance with the Torah they teach you, you are to carry out the judgment they render 
not turning aside to the right or to the left from the verdict they declare to you. Anyone presumptuous enough not to pay attention to the Kohen appointed there to serve Adonai your God or to the judge, that person must die. Thus you will exterminate such wickedness from Israel. All the people will hear about it and will be afraid to continue acting presumptuously. The blessing following the reading of the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Asher natan lanu Torah temet, Bechaye olam nata betochenu, Baruch atah Adonai, Nothing of Torah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth, and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. And now for the congregational response following the reading of the Torah. Bezod ha Torah, Asher Samboshe, Lifne Bene Yisrael, Api Adonai, Biyad Moshe. Moses placed before the children of Israel. It is in accord with the Lord's command by the hand of Moses. A tree of life it is for those who take hold of it, and blessed are the ones who support it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Turn us, O Lord, to you, and let us return. Renew our days as of old. Amen. And now for the blessing before the reading of the Haftarah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose good prophets, delighting in their words which were spoken truthfully. Blessed are you, O Lord, who chose the Torah, your servant Moses, your people Israel, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. Amen. Amen. Our half-tara portion for this evening is from Isaiah chapter 52, verses 6 through 10. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Yeshayahu Hanavi. We'll be reading from chapter 52, verses 6 through 10, found on page 520 in the Complete Jewish Bible. Therefore, my people will know my name. Therefore, on that day, they will know that I, the one speaking, here I am. How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news, proclaiming shalom, bringing good news of good things, announcing salvation, and saying to Zion, your God is king. Listen, your watchmen are raising their voices shouting for joy together. For they will see before their own eyes Adonai returning to Zion. Break out into joy, sing together, you ruins of Yerushalayim. For Adonai is comforted his people. He has redeemed Yerushalayim. Adonai has bared his holy arm in the sight of every nation 
and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Amen. Amen. The blessing following the reading of the half Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, rock of all ages, righteous throughout all generations. You are the faithful God, promising and then performing, first speaking, then fulfilling, for all your words are true and righteous. Faithful are you, O Lord our God, and faithful are your words, for no word of yours shall remain unfulfilled. You are a faithful and merciful God and King. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who are faithful in fulfilling your words. Amen. Amen. And now the blessing before the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Anybody know? <laughs> Asher Nathan Lanu Mashiach Yeshua, the Harim Roshel Habrit Afasha, Baruch Atah Adonai, Miltain Habrit Afasha. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua and the words of the renewed covenant. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the new covenant. Amen. Our Brit Hakadashah portion for tonight is from Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 through 11. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Matit Yahu HaShaliyah. We'll be reading from chapter 15, verses 7 through 11, on page 1242, Complete Jewish Bible. You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Amen. And now the blessing following the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Asher natan lanu haravar haemet, Lechai olam lata betochenu, Baruch atah Adonai, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the renewed covenant. Amen. When the ark rested, Moses would say, Return, O Lord, to the myriads of Israel's families. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and your mighty ark. Clothe your priest with righteousness. May those who have experienced your faithful love shout for joy. Hallelujah! For the sake of your servant David, do not delay the return of your Messiah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who gives us the living word in the Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Amen. When the ark is closed, y'all may be seated. Please join me in reciting He being merciful. He being merciful forgives iniquity and does not destroy. Frequently he turns away his anger and does not stir up all his wrath. 
For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, and exceedingly kind to all who call upon you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Yeshua, our Messiah, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Now we will have the young people aged 11 and under uh, with an opportunity to go to a class in the fellowship area. Uh, where they will learn about the portions that we are studying tonight. And we just ask the Lord to bless uh, the teachers. We ask to bless the students uh, and that they would uh, just learn more about the truths of God through the lesson this evening. We ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Last week, we talked about the dietary laws that the Lord has established that can help us to better understand the concept of holiness, being kadosh, uh, set apart, sanctified, so that we might be used more effectively for his purpose. We also talked about the Shemitah in the Hebrew, the release that was to take place every seven years for Israelites who had become enslaved because they were unable to pay off the debt. We connected this to the ultimate release that we have experienced, that we have been able to obtain, because as we like to put it, Messiah Yeshua paid a debt that he did not owe because we owed a debt that we could not pay. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Avinu Makenu, our Father, our King, Lord, we just desire to learn truths from your word this evening uh, that it would be a blessing that it would uh, help us in the challenges that we may face in the days ahead. I pray that you would open eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive from you this evening. I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. My rock and my redeemer, I ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. This week's Torah portion begins in Deuteronomy 16, verse 18. If you want to follow along, it's called Shoftim, which means judges. judges. Um, <clears throat> the judges that Moses has been told to appoint along with tribal leaders so that there will be uh, justice uh, ministered to at all the gates of the city so that there will be righteous judgment once the Jewish people settle in the land. Our world is full of injustice. I probably don't have to tell you that. I certainly don't have to tell our Jewish people that these days. Uh, as even in our own nation, the Jewish people today are expected to tolerate expressions that call for our elimination. Words that are condemned as unacceptable when they're directed toward any other group. But our God is described as the judge over all the earth. In Genesis 18, verse 25, you may remember, Abraham is bargaining with the Lord, trying to save the people of Sodom, Sodom. And he says to the Lord, shall not the judge of the whole world not exercise justice? This is why in Deuteronomy 17, verse 8, the Lord says that if there was a situation, as we read earlier, that was too difficult or controversial for one of the local judges, the case was to be brought before the Kohanim, the priests, and a shofet, a judge, in some type of regional higher court. Excuse me, in Deuteronomy 17, verses 11 and 12, Regarding the rulings of these higher courts, it says you are to act according to the instruction they teach you and the judgment they tell you. You must not turn aside from the sentence they tell you to the right or to the left. The man who does not listen to the Kohen, the priest, who stands to serve there before Adonai, the Lord your God, or to the judge, that man must die. Now, even though this is talking about a judge and a priest uh, in these regional courts that have been established for the more difficult matters, the rabbis of traditional Judaism have interpreted these verses to be talking about them. 
And what comes of that as a result is that whatever conclusions that the rabbis have reached in terms of interpretation cannot be challenged, even if they run counter to the scriptures, which they unfortunately sometimes do. Now, as you've seen in our service tonight, we incorporate a lot of the aspects of traditional Judaism. As somebody who was born into a Jewish family and raised Jewish, though not particularly uh, observant, uh, nonetheless, um, there are many things about Jewish tradition that are part of my heritage, part of my connection to the Jewish people. And for those who come who aren't Jewish, this gives you a chance to make a connection that I believe is important because we are described as believers as being part of the Commonwealth of Israel in Ephesians chapter 2. And so uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, reality is that we have structured our service so that if a Jewish, people come, a Jewish person comes to the service, they will see many things that are familiar to their worship experience in the traditional synagogue but there will be one drastic difference. And that is we proclaim Yeshua from the moment you walk into the door until the moment you leave. Um, because that, it, even though we present him in a Jewish context, we want them to be able to consider his claims in something that is familiar to them. And so uh, <clears throat> we embrace many of the traditions as long as they don't run counter to truths revealed in the scriptures. Now, sometimes they do. We're going to see that during the high holy days. Uh, after the destruction of the second temple, the Jewish leaders changed the rules for atonement, and the rabbis of today have embraced the ruling. While the scriptures require a blood atonement, um, the leaders of that time concluded that atonement can be achieved without a blood sacrifice through teshuvah, We've already talked about that earlier tonight. Repentance, through tefillah, prayer, and through tzedakah, good works, or giving to charity. Instead of seeing that the requirement was fulfilled in Yeshua, they've simply decided to overturn the clear scriptural connection between the blood and atonement. And we see this clearly in Vayikra Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, tells us, the soul of the flesh is in the blood. The soul of the flesh, the life, uh, the Hebrew is, is the word for soul, is in the blood. And it's been given to us upon the altar to make atonement for our souls. That's a literal translation of what the Hebrew says. The blood has been given to us upon the altar. Now, when those words were written, it was talking about an earthly altar. And it was talking about the sacrifice of bulls and goats and sheep. But we know that the ultimate sacrifice was the sacrifice of the Lamb of God offered up on a heavenly altar. That that blood being shed is what makes atonement for our souls. Amen. Yeshua says in Matthew 15 verse 3 that the traditions of men are not to take precedence over the written word of God. The justice system established by the Lord for his people and our current justice system for that matter are supposed to be a blessing to us. They're supposed to produce righteous justice throughout the land. But it only works when it lines up with God's instructions. Men will come up with their own ideas and we have to evaluate those against the instructions that we find in the scripture. Because if we are honest about it, we all desire fairness in our judicial system, don't we? We have a sense of righteous indignation when we feel that we, or even someone else, has been treated unfairly, don't we? And that's why it's important that we treat one another fairly in our interactions, in our congregational community. Even in the world, treating one another fairly can be a testimony to the world. We have to overcome our fleshly nature, which tends to act very selfishly. But if we act selflessly, when we interact with the world, we represent the unconditional love of God 
to people who don't know him, something that they are otherwise unlikely to experience in this world. How many of you know who Jeff Foxworthy is? Could say how many don't, but anyway, he's the, uh, you might be a redneck comedian, right? <clears throat> uh, anyway, he regularly went to Chick-fil-A when he was growing up, back when there was only one Chick-fil-A restaurant. <laughs> Uh, the owner, Jay Truett Kathy, asked him one day, uh, Jeff, do you know how to tell if someone needs a word of encouragement? When Jeff said he didn't know, Mr. Kathy said, when you see that they are breathing. In other words, everyone appreciates a word of encouragement. And he points out it requires no special training. You don't have to know Hebrew. You don't have to know Greek. You don't have to study the Talmud. And it doesn't cost us anything. You, you can be rich. You can be materially poor in this world or, or struggling, whatever it is. We still have what it takes to offer encouragement, to be a blessing to others. This highly successful and wealthy comedian says that since that day, he's made an effort to encourage others which has helped him to see the positive in people as he seeks to compliment any of the people he encounters about something positive in their lives. He's really trying to see them through God's eyes. And we're thankful that God sees us through his eyes, but then we have the opportunity to see others in that way as well. Um, <clears throat> this world is all about whining. Uh, anybody got a two-year-old? Um, a teenager? Adult children? No, never mind. Um, complaining. Uh, it seems so easy to complain, uh, to look at our situation and so quickly to forget about the blessing and just focus on that one thing that our flesh isn't happy about. Uh, making excuses, rationalizing making it seem like we haven't done anything wrong. There's a reason that we acted that way. The reality is we have violated God's standard of righteousness. We have violated the concept of justice in the land. But there, in reality, there is one place that we don't want justice, and that's in our spiritual lives. Even though we get all upset when we don't see it in the world, the reality is we don't want the justice we deserve for our rebellion against our creator. What's the penalty for sin? It's death. But ironically, our ultimate blessing comes from Messiah Yeshua receiving injustice. He dies when he did nothing wrong on our behalf as he took on the penalty that we deserve for our sins and satisfied the requirement to bring right, to enable us to be seen as righteous in God's sight. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 tells us uh, that Yeshua satisfied the requirement because he is described as one who knew no sin, who became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That, that our sins are forgiven because of the unrighteousness that was displayed toward him. So uh, when we see unrighteousness in the world, it's okay to become upset about it. But when we are treated unrighteously, we have to realize that's exactly what we deserve. It's only by the grace that we get of God that we get to experience righteousness in this, this world. It's only because the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua on our behalf. There's nothing that we can do to be seen as righteous in God's sight. There's nothing that we can do that makes us deserve justice uh, in our world. And uh, the Lord uses many different ways and pictures and types to reveal his truths in the scripture. We've talked about Deuteronomy being written in the form of a treaty of that time called a suzerainty treaty. And we're in the midst of the portions called the stipulations. The requirements that are imposed upon the servants. 
uh, the Israelites when this was originally given, but by extension, us as well. And these stipulations have been specified by the, by the other party to this type of treaty, what's referred to as a suzerain or a king, who in this case is our creator, God. In Deuteronomy 17, verse 1, there's a stipulation that the sacrifices of the people are to be without blemish or defect. And that's why Yeshua's sinlessness is so important. Uh, there are many people in this world who say, oh, he was a good person. Uh, but the reality is, he, in order to be acceptable as a sacrifice, he had to be without blemish or defect. Being sinless is an achievement no mere man is able to accomplish. Another stipulation, and, and so we are blessed in that God looks down, sees our predicament, and says, they can't achieve this on their own. I am going to provide my son. And he decided that long ago, before the world was ever created. He had a plan, and his plan is to make that sacrifice available to you tonight, to me, to, to those of us who have not yet accepted it, perhaps even watching on the video. Another stipulation of Deuteronomy 17 was a prohibition against idolatry. Deuteronomy 17 verse 5 specifies the death penalty as the punishment for those who worship foreign gods. But this penalty is carried out only after the matter is thoroughly investigated and if there are, there are at least two witnesses to testify against the accused. We also see in Deuteronomy 17 verses 14 and 15 that Israel wanted to have an earthly king just like the surrounding nations. And despite the Lord's objection, he would still give his people a king. But today, Israel does not have a king. The leaders of our people rejected their last king, Messiah Yeshua. What did it say over his head when he was executed? For all to see in three different languages, according to John 19, verses 19 and 20, it said, Yeshua of Nazareth, king of the Jews. <clears throat> in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Even though the Jewish leadership did not accept him as king, Yeshua told them in Matthew 23, verse 39, they would not see him again until they say, you can say it with me, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Deuteronomy 17, verse 18 stipulates that the king is to make himself a copy of the Torah. In the Hebrew, it's Mishneh HaTorah which is where the term Mishnah Torah comes from, and that's a name that is sometimes used by the rabbis for the book of Deuteronomy. The Israelites are also warned in Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 11, to avoid the idolatrous practices of the previous inhabitants. They're not to pass their children through the fire, and they're to avoid those who practice magic, cast spells, interpret signs, or consult with spirits in any other way. I think as we think about that today, we think we're less likely to pass our children through the fire than we are to encounter those who practice magic or cast spells or interpret signs or consult with spirits. But the reality is, uh, as Rabbi Jonathan Kahn has revealed in his latest book, The Josiah Manifesto, he equates the modern evil of abortion on demand with the idea of ancient child sacrifice. And when you put those two together, you realize that as a nation, not only have we embraced this concept, but we have sought to export it to other nations. Our nation has been a blessing to so many other nations. We bring uh, Western values. We bring principles of, of liberty and, and freedom that, that inspire other nations. Uh, but unfortunately, in recent times, We've also uh, exported not only what is good about our country, uh, but this concept. We, we, we forced it on nations that, that were opposed to it. And so we pray for our nation. We pray on behalf of our nation that the Lord would forgive us uh, for this crime against him. This crime that, that everyone understands is a wrong thing to do. 
God has never asked for this. And the reality is uh, the gods in the pagan world are gods that the people have made with their own hands, so they can't ask for anything. But we also pray that our Jewish people, particularly in Israel, would turn back to the Lord in his ways. Because many things that we do in the United States, our people in Israel are guilty of as well. That the people of the book, our Jewish people who are once again dwelling in that land, would <laughs> repent of this evil and would realize that this is the same mindset that caused the Lord to expel the previous inhabitants of the land thousands of years ago. Leviticus 18 verse 28 says not only that these types of activities are why he cast out the former inhabitants of the land, but this verse also says if the Israelites do these same things, the land would expel them as well. A lot of people think the Jewish people get a, a free pass, but the reality is God's system of justice doesn't take into account uh, and, and overlook sin. He doesn't wink at sin, and there's always an accountability for sin. In Deuteronomy 18, we find an important prophecy that the rabbis see as applying to the Messiah. In Deuteronomy um, 15, verse 18, the Lord said that he would raise up a prophet like Moses and that the Lord would put his words in this prophet's mouth. And again, the people were required to listen to what this prophet says. And this prophecy was fulfilled in part through the appointment of Moses' replacement, Yehoshua, Joshua, to lead them into the promised land. It was also fulfilled in part by the Hebrew prophets that came afterwards. Those who would make proclamations to the Israelites saying, thus saith the Lord. But then we have the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy found in only Messiah Yeshua. Because just as Moses redeemed the Jewish people out of bondage in Egypt, this prophet would redeem all mankind from their bondage to sin through the final renewal of the covenant that God has made. According to Jeremiah 31, verse 31, the covenants made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, this final covenant renewal, uh, the blessings of this renewal will be made available to all who would believe in Messiah Yeshua's sacrifice on their behalf. That's why sometimes we call it the new covenant, sometimes we call it the renewed covenant, because uh, we want people to understand that this is not something new and different. Uh, as Paul says in Romans 9, verse 4, that God has established all of his covenants with the Jewish people, other than the covenants that came before Abraham. To them belong the promises and the blessings. Like I said earlier, it's only by becoming part of the commonwealth of Israel, according to Ephesians chapter 2, something that is made available to the Gentiles because even though they were once for, far off, the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua has enabled them to draw near and even become, as we point out uh, on a regular basis, sojourners. And um, the role of the sojourner in uh, the life of the Jewish community uh, was a very important one as it was a role of mutual blessing. The Jewish people were blessed by the work that the sojourners were doing in their midst. The sojourners were treated as part of the community in virtually every way. And the reality is the sojourners are blessings in the Messianic movement, uh, blessings that we take for granted sometimes, blessings that we didn't expect back in the 70s, about 50 years ago, that this is the way things were going to go. But the reality is, uh, other than in Israel, virtually uh, all Messianic congregations, particularly in the United States, are majority non-Jewish. And so as a community, God uses our different parts, our different callings, our different uh, expressions, our different experiences to bring us together with Messiah Yeshua as the head. Amen? Amen. And the concept of the sojourner, unfortunately, is frequently translated, even in Messianic translations, as outsider or foreigner or alien. But the reality is that that word has a great deal of inclusiveness 
uh, in it. And frequently, uh, when it's used in verb form, it'll be translated property. They'll say the alien who sojourns with you or the outsider who sojourns with you. But it's the same word both times, just in noun and verb form. So it should really be the sojourner who is sojourning with you, the sojourner who is dwelling in your midst. Uh, and like I said, that's a tremendous blessing. Uh, speaking of blessings, Deuteronomy 19, verses 2 and 3, uh, has the blessing of the city of refuge. That once again, in terms of justice, uh, in these cities run by the Levites, someone who is accused of murder is able to stay there until it's determined whether the death was murder or manslaughter. If the crime is deemed to be murder, the murderer is, is handed over to the family avenger. It's understood that if someone murders a family member, justice will be sought, uh, that, that the emotions will cause uh, the, a member of the family to feel like they have to avenge the death. But if the death is accidental, the accused can remain in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest, uh, as we find in Numbers 35, verse 28. Apparently, the high priest's death provides some sort of substitutionary atonement for the sin of manslaughter. Because in Deuteronomy 21, we find that even when the perpetrator of a killing is unknown, atonement, forgiveness, is still needed. According to Deuteronomy 21, verse 3, when a murdered body is found and the perpetrator is unknown, a young cow from the town closest to where the body is found is to be put to death. And according to Deuteronomy 21, verse 8, the leaders of that town are to say, this blood was not shed by our hands, nor have we seen who did it. Lord, grant atonement, kaper, to your people Israel, whom you have redeemed. Do not allow innocent blood to be shed among your people. This verse also says that the blood of the cow shall provide atonement, nikaper, for them. As again, we see the connection between the blood and atonement. <clears throat> now I want to talk for a moment about this week's Haftarah portion. We're actually covering the fourth in a series of seven Haftarah of consolation that are selected in the seven weeks following the ninth of Av, the Jewish day of calamity, as you can see on the screen. Uh, the day of the destruction of both temples, uh, as well as uh, numerous other events, the Jewish people being banished from England and Spain. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, we are encouraged when we see Zechariah 8.19, which tells us our days of mourning and fasting will one day be turned into days of joy and gladness and celebration. The Haftarah portion for this week is Isaiah 51, verse 12, through Isaiah 52, verse 12. It starts out with words of consolation from the Lord. The Hebrew is, Anohi, Anohi, Hu Menachem Chem, which means I, with the doubling of the Hebrew for emphasis on the word I. I am the one who comforts you. It goes on to suggest in the next verse, that the Jewish people are acting out of fear for those who, from those who seek their destruction. The Lord reminds them of his awesome power, that he is the one who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. They don't need to have any fear of man as long as God is on their side. We don't need to have any fear of man as long as God is on our side. The Lord tells them in Isaiah 51, verse 16, Ami Ata, you are my people. And after describing the people as though they've been in a drunken stupor because they've been drinking the cup of his fury, he tells the people their time of punishment will soon end and that they will once again be back in their land, something that we are seeing fulfilled even in our day. And Isaiah 52 continues to describe the future blessing of Jerusalem. As we sang earlier, uh, it starts out, Awake, awake, clothe yourself in strength, Zion, Zion. Clothe yourself in beautiful garments, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. The holy city for the uncircumcised and the unclean will never invade you again. As we sang earlier in the Manabu, uh, verse 7 of Isaiah 52, there's one coming who will proclaim, uh, who will bring good news. 
Mashmi'a Shalom, proclaiming peace. Mashmi'a Yeshua, as you sang earlier, proclaiming salvation, saying to Zion, Malach Elohai, your God reigns. I always point out that it's important when we talk to the Jewish people to describe the Lord and to describe the Messiah as your God and your Messiah so they realize that the God we worship is the God of Israel. That, that the Messiah we worship is the Messiah of the Jewish people. Even though his sacrificial atonement is provided for all mankind, nonetheless, the Jewish people frequently, when they hear church people talking to them, they talk in terms and it doesn't sound Jewish at all. The Haftarah portion closes for telling that just as it was during the Exodus, the Lord will go ahead of you and the God of Israel will be behind you. That's how the traditional Haftarah portion ends in Isaiah 52, verse 13. But in reality, the ultimate verses of consolation are found in the next chapter. Isaiah 53, a chapter that's not read in the synagogue because it sounds too much like what Yeshua did when he was here on earth. A chapter which prophesies the ultimate act of consolation, the work of the righteous suffering servant, who will serve as an asham, a trespass offering, according to Isaiah 53, verse 10, who will see his seed, who will have his days prolonged, who will bring deliverance from sin for the Jewish people and all who would believe on him. Praise the Lord. I pray, and, and when I... Um, was first, somebody first shared with me. It, it happened to be somebody who wasn't Jewish, but he was attending a synagogue led by a Jewish believer. And when he shared with me, one of the first things he read to me was Isaiah 53. And when I heard it, I said, I don't know much. That could be Jesus, I suppose, out of your Christian Bible, but I am certain that is not going to read that. Those words are not going to be what I find when I read that in my Jewish Bible. And I went up to my room and I got out my Jewish Bible. And sure enough, it sounded exactly like what he just read. And so that began a process of saying, oh, OK, what do the scriptures really say? Uh, and it wasn't long after that that I, I came to believe. But um, <clears throat> the Jewish people will only listen uh, in, in large part when we share what we believe as a Jewish concept, when we share truths from the Hebrew scriptures like Isaiah 53 and Jeremiah 31, referring to the new covenant being made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, uh, as we spoke about earlier. Uh, <clears throat> tonight, we've seen how instructions that God gave to his people for the purpose of ensuring that there would be righteous judgments in the land are used by the rabbis to say that their interpretations can override God's revelation found in the scriptures. In the Haftarah, the portion from the prophets, uh, in Isaiah 52 mostly, uh, 50, the end of 51 and 52, we saw another instance where Israel had been punished for their lack of faithfulness to God, but then we saw that all we had to do was keep reading and there will come a time when she will be blessed and her old enemies will receive the punishment that they deserve for how they've treated God's people. We also saw the Jewish people wanted an earthly king and that they rejected the king of the universe, Messiah Yeshua, that he provided 2,000 years ago. And it is our prayer that they will allow Yeshua, who can reign as king in our hearts today, and bring forgiveness for our rebellion against our creator, but who also is coming again, and who one day will reign as king over all the earth, and is, he will be coming to deliver our people in Israel out of the hands of their enemies. So as our people pray regularly, based on Zechariah 14, verse 9, may the kingdom of David's greater son be established forever, for on that day the Lord shall be one, and his name one. And we say tonight, come, Lord, as King of kings and Lord of lords, come and reign over your people. Amen? Amen. Now, as I shared earlier, there may be someone here tonight. You haven't yet accepted the sacrifice uh, that God provided through his son, Yeshua. And there's no other way to achieve atonement 
it, to have our sins forgiven. We can't be good enough um, to accomplish that. God has provided the way. There has to be a blood sacrifice in order for there to be atonement. And it can't be our own because we are not blemish free. We already saw that Yeshua is the only one who meets that requirement. So I'd like to ask with every head bowed and every eye closed. Allowing the Spirit of God to minister to hearts that are here right now or hearts who may be watching uh, this video later. If you are ready to trust in the promises of the creator of the universe this evening, or whenever you're watching, to say yes to Yeshua, to accept his atoning sacrifice on your behalf, would you just raise your hand to signify that, and then you can put it right back down. Is there anyone? We always give this opportunity. We never take for granted that everyone has made uh, this decision. We've had people come forward to make it uh, in the congregation at, at times. But now, even though no one uh, raised their hand, uh, there are truths that we have mentioned in the message tonight that are tied to even uh, realities in our lives as followers of Messiah. You know, we heard the blast of the trumpet tonight, which was sounded as a call to look within. And so I ask you, Lord, to speak to those of us who need to hear from you tonight. Perhaps you've wandered away from God. You can turn back to him and then draw close to him. And he will uh, just welcome you with his open arms, with an everlasting love that can sustain you through any trial you may be facing. Or maybe what has been coming out of your mouth has not been so nice. Let us ask the Lord to purify our hearts so that we might be more a fit vessel to be used for his purposes in the days ahead. Remember, it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles us, not what goes in. Maybe you've been acting out of fear in some area of your life. The scriptures tell us over and over again, al tirah, fear not. As tonight you can say to the Lord, I don't want to act out of fear. Generally speaking, when we act out of fear, the results will not be good. But we can act in faith. We can trust in the Lord more and lean on our own understanding less. If you're ready to trust in the Lord with all your heart tonight, all you have to do is say yes to him. Or perhaps he would have you make a change in some other area. At this time, I just ask you to raise your hand if he has shown you any area where he is calling you to change. Any area where you want to commit uh, to making a change for the Lord, to drawing closer to him, uh, to, to de desiring him in, in a greater way, to trusting in him more. As Lord, we thank you for this season of Teshuvah, as you are calling your people to turn back to you. And Lord... Just uh, help us in any areas where we have strayed that we would draw back to you even right now. Lord, we pray that our Jewish people would hear a call of Yeshua, a call of salvation, which is what Yeshua means, as we saw in the Manavu uh, song. We ask that you would open the eyes of the rest of the believing community to your love and faithfulness toward the Jewish people. And Lord, help us to see the best in those we encounter. Help us to see them through your eyes. And Lord, we just ask that uh, your love would so fill us that it would overflow to others and that we would share the unconditional love that we have received in our relationships. As we thank you for all you're doing in our lives, in the life of our congregation, and in the life of our people Israel. Uh, we pray for their victory. We pray for the safe return of the hostages. We pray for your uh, demonstrating your miraculous power in the world today. And Lord, we thank you that we can come before you and ask all these things in the name above all names, the matchless name of your son, Messiah Yeshua. And everyone said, amen and amen. God bless you all. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you all for coming. Now I'm going to call the cantor back up to perform the traditional blessings that we recite at the end of the Sabbath service called the Kiddush and the Hamotzi. Kiddush comes from the same root as Kadosh, which means holy as we sanctify or set the service apart. And the Hamotzi is where we thank the Lord for his provision. We can say it together. Glory, glory, Amen. Bless.
Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who creates the truth of the divine. Amen. Bahaim. Baruch Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread and all my And as we're getting ready to uh, stand and receive the blessing found in Numbers chapter 6, referred to as the Aaronic blessing, or the Birkat Hakoanim, the blessing of the priests, um, I just want to mention that we have uh, the new calendars because we're coming up on uh, the Feast of Trumpets is celebrated by the Jewish people as the new year. Um, the calendars go all the way through December 2025, so you're getting like a four-month bonus at no extra charge. Um, they're like $10 in what's left of our gift shop because uh, we should have a sign-up saying, uh, pardon the mess, but um, we're hoping to be moving very soon. Uh, however, we will let you know. Do not doubt. We will get the word out. Um, and right now, it's still looking like a couple weeks away, uh, maybe three or four so far. But um, you can pick up the calendars, $10 in the gift shop. And now we would ask you to please stand as we are going to pronounce the blessing that are actually the Lord's words of blessing that he told Moses uh, to have his brother, Aharon, Aaron, as the first Kohen Gadol, as the first high priest, uh, to pronounce these words of blessing over the people. So we encourage you to stand and receive these words of blessing from the Lord this evening. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord calls his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may he grant unto you his peace. Amen. And now we'll have our closing song. It's the Adon Alam, where we get the name of our congregation. And we'll sing it first in the Hebrew, like I did in the synagogue growing up. And then we'll sing it in the English, like I didn't do in the synagogue growing up. So you'll know exactly what you've just sung in the Hebrew, the Adon Alam. Adon Alam, Asher Malach, Peace. 
He still shall reign in majesty. He was, he is, he shall remain. All glory us eternally. Incomparable, unique is he. No other can his oneness share. Without beginning, without end, dominion's might is his to bear. He is my living God who saves. My rock when grief or trials befall, my banner and my refuge strong, my bounteous portion when I call, my soul I give unto his care. Asleep, awake, for he is near, and with my soul, my body too, God is with me, I have no fear. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy the time of fellowship. I'm hoping our visitors can stay and enjoy what we call the Oneg Shabbat. Um, you can even let them go ahead of you in the line. Uh, have a great week. Oh, let me give you a quick update. We're trying to get the final inspection scheduled on the new building. I should have mentioned that when I said how soon we would be in it. Um, so until we get the uh, scheduling of the final inspection, we really can't yet set a date for the move. But on, uh, continue to pray for favor uh, with officials in the city, and uh, hopefully we will have a good report by next Friday. Uh, enjoy the time of fellowship. Have a great week. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.